Hi. Hey, Grace. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. That's good. Is it, are you, you're in Toronto, right? I am in Toronto. It's a little gloomy today. Yeah. It's been on and off rain like all day. I know, but <laughs> it's what it is. It is. Yeah. I'm hoping we'll see a rainbow at some point because it's been just yeah, like sun. optimistic of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so for our viewers, um, this is, I'm, I'm having a discussion today with Ali Adams, our sen the Senior Marketing Communications Manager at McCarthy's. Um, thank you so much, Ali, for joining um, the CSC's Instagram live session today. And um, yeah, and uh, do you just kind of want to get started with um, kind of just telling our audience a little bit about your story and, and yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, thanks so much for having me, Grace. I really appreciate it. And um, so I, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm type 1 diabetic and have been so for 30 years. Uh, so I've been living with type 1 diabetes um, and all of the sort of ups and downs that come with a chronic disease for quite some time. And in November of 2019, I was diagnosed with uh, stage 4 kidney failure. Um, and since then, my kidney failure sort of has increased, obviously, uh, and, my, and I'm now at stage five, which means that my kidney function is about at 10%. So you can imagine most people's kidneys function at 100% mm -hmm. and mine function at 10%. Um, and with that comes a whole host of complications. Okay. Uh, but the solve for it and one of the um, things that I'm pursuing now is obviously um, a kidney pancreas transplant um, and one of the ways um, that you can do a kidney pancreas transplant is actually to get the living donor and I had no idea about living organ donation that it was even conceptually possible until uh, this happened to me so in part why I'm here and I guess why we're having this discussion is to talk about living organ donation um, and how really it's kind of the future of, of transplant and it's how we're going to save tons of people. Right. Yeah. And no, and just, and just on your note on, um, you know, um, having this discussion here and talking about it, which is, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a traditional way of, of, you know, advocating for this and, so have you found that, you know, now that things have kind of gone more online, um, that you're able to facilitate this discussion further and have this discussion further rather than rely on like physical events or, um, you know, uh, networking events? Yeah. And you know, so this all happened to me uh, in the context of COVID. So I don't really know anything other than... Um, yeah pursuing it online. I think the thing obviously that is so powerful about choosing to advocate for myself by way of sort of these untraditional channels is the reach and the extent in which uh, a message can travel is basically limitless. And when I posted my original video uh, sort of expressing help and, and asking for people to get involved, I didn't really have any expectations. I knew that it was important to share my story and to be vulnerable, uh, which was sort of uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Normally I'm a bit of like a closed book sort of person. Uh, so crying in front of like people is not normally what I like to do. Um, yeah. But I think what I really took from that was that in order to get help you have to ask for help and you have to not be afraid mm -hmm. and what will come back to you will be so overwhelming in in the most positive way um but yeah to sort of go back to your question i think it may be untraditional but um it's really allowed for the message to go much further and wider than i really thought possible yeah, no, really, exactly. And, and just on that point, too, like you, why, why did you choose LinkedIn as a platform to kind of 
to tell your story. That's, yeah. that's unconventional in itself and, and uh, inspiring, I think. Yeah, thanks. I, I guess it's sort of twofold, my answer. The first is a little bit more like blue sky philosophical, and the second part is a bit more technical. I think on the blue sky side, I have spent my whole career building relationships with people. I, you know, have invested so much time in, into people and uh, it's what makes this all happen. Relationships are really, I think, at the core of what makes people and business ultimately so successful. Yeah. And so I was sort of thinking like, if I'm going to ask for help, I should probably ask for help from people who know me and who have a connection to me. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't know if like I put my photo on the side of a bus, if anyone would really care or be interested, but I felt like if I was able to put myself out there to people that I already knew, um, that maybe somebody would watch. Yeah. Um, and I think the the more technical side of that is that, you know, having been in marketing and communications my entire life, I, at a very technical level, understand the benefit of, you know, multimedia, using social media, um, engaging with your audience in a way that it is real and, you know, without any uh, corporate speak, it's just like, be who you are. And so, yeah, so I gave it a shot. And I didn't really have an option to be honest with you, Grace. Like, yeah. what do you do in that situation? You kind of have to ask yourself, like, I need a kidney and I need help. And yeah. I can't be afraid to ask for it. And I just had to kind of put myself out there. That, that, that's really brave of you, really. Yeah. Um, and just on the topic of, like, you know, you reaching out to your peers and to, you know, your, your, your network. Um, you know, how, how, how does someone best utilize their peer support group? Like, how did you best utilize your peer support group? And, and what are different avenues of success that, that are non-traditional just outside of LinkedIn that you've seen? Yeah, so I think for me, what has been the most surprising in this entire sort of two months that really this has all happened is when you put yourself out there, people will show up for you. Yeah. And you, you know, as an individual have obviously like spent time investing in relationships and those relationships will come back and people want to help, but people just sometimes don't know how to help. Mm -hmm. And I think what um, I've learned in terms of support is that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to say, you know what, these are my boundaries and I, and this is sort of where I draw the line in the sand. Um, but to me, it's just been about being honest with myself, about being honest with those around me. Um, everyone at work obviously now knows that this is something I'm going through. Um, and so I kind of have to say, like, if I'm having a bad day or I'm not feeling well, like, I'm not feeling well. And, uh, you know, I'll manage that as I, as I have to. Um, but it's not overshooting. It's just saying it kind of is what it is. And in terms of like unconventional ways of support, I think it's just human relate. It goes back to relationships every time. Like if I'm sad or I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling like I need to laugh or whatever it is, it's just like reaching out to the people that you know are going to just be like, all right, cool, like cry. And yeah. you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Cry and then you get on with it. Yeah, yeah. And and no, and, and to your point where, you know, people will show up for you, um, kind of leads into my next question, which is, you know, were you surprised um when you put yourself out there? Were you surprised uh by people or groups that showed up for you and how did you feel? Uh so I cried a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I was not I don't know if I had any expectations about this going into it. I was sort of in a position where I was a little bit desperate. I needed help. I sat on my floor in my living room and made a video and kind of like closed my eyes and it went out there. 
Mm -hmm. um, what was surprising to me was the number of people that responded, A, but who shared their personal stories as well. And I think that's one of the most important takeaways for me in this entire process that everyone is going through something in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And sometimes it's behind closed doors and sometimes it's not, and it doesn't really matter. Like whatever people's preference is to talk about it is completely up to them. But the extension of help, of similar stories, of tips and ideas and offerings of support was just so unbelievable. Amazing. And like it was so unexpected. Um, so that's sort of how I would answer that question. It's just, I had no idea how many people were so willing to help. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, that's touching. It is, it's, it's surprising sometimes, you know, when you put yourself out there, who will show up for you? Yeah, no, for sure. And I think too, what is also kind of important to note is to my point about everyone sort of going through something, one of the, the, the really helpful things for me in a situation that was so unknown, I had no idea about what it meant to have kidney failure, like how to manage it, what it was going to mean to sort of go through this process to have to look for a donor, to go through the surgery, to recover, like all of this was so unknown to me. Yeah. And people reaching out saying, oh, like my sister, you know, had a kidney transplant or I had a kidney transplant or I've had kidney issues has given me a line of sight into some of the tips and sort of things that I just had no idea about. Wow. And the, the magnitude of information is obviously so much larger when you can hear it from other people and ask questions and sort of dig into some of those issues. So for me, it's been um, really helpful because a lot of most people who are going through this are old and like really okay. old. And I'm, yes. I'm 30 in my 35th year, so I've still got some time to go, hopefully. Um, so yeah, so it's been helpful to just have that sort of context. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and just on that point, you know, you, you are younger. Um, what, like, I don't even know how to, it's it, like, what, how are you feeling? Like, how did you feel? And how is this, how has this impacted your life at such a young age to have, 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 you know, found out this information? Like, how is this impacting you? How are you going about your, your everyday life? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, Difficult to explain because it's been over the course of, you know, obviously a while that my kidney function has started to deteriorate. So um, I'm definitely tired all the time. Um, and it's a little bit morbid to sort of articulate, but in a sense, I am, my body is shutting down. Like I am not well. Um, and it occupies quite a bit of time in my mind mentally to just sort of keep up with everything like there is um if you think about sort of like a swimming pool like lane one is kidney failure and then layer on that type one diabetes and then full-time job and friends and family and being an active member of community like that's a lot of layers and I think in terms of managing it all it's kind of that what we talked about, which is just leaning on your support network, admitting when you're not okay. Um, and that the impact of that is that it alleviates some of those, those layers. But yeah, it's certainly not easy. It's not like a good time. Um, but a lot has come out of it in a positive way. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which is you know, eventually all of these sort of complications that I'm going through daily will end. And I will have a kidney that works, I'll have a pancreas that works, I won't have type 1 diabetes, I won't have kidney failure, and I will be at 100%. And 
that's exciting. Yeah, no, that is exciting. And, and, and just, uh, just on that topic itself too, is, you know, I think that um, it's important for us to normalize talking about uh, mental health. Um, it's a big, it's a big topic of conversation, especially, you know, in the pandemic. Um, are there any, if, are there any kinds of mental health, um, you know, um, have you, have you come across mental health in, in a different way? Yeah. So, um, listen, it's heavy news to take on that you're ready to get a dual transplant yeah. and, um, it's hard to see your body change in real time uh, in a way that's not positive. So, you know, an example of that was a couple of weeks ago, my, my red blood cell count, which uh, needs to be between like 100 and 120, was at like 80. And I was just, for lack of a better term, like a shell of a human. I was like exhausted by the time I woke up. I could barely get through the day without a nap. You know, I was dreary in the face. I was feeling nauseous all the time. And I just felt sick. I felt like this is, this is what like dying feels like. It's not enjoyable. And that's hard to mentally compartmentalize when you're trying to also like keep a happy face and keep a, you know, a smile on your face to, to get through the day. Yeah. I think the thing ultimately that moves me and keeps me going is that I just don't believe in giving up. I don't believe in it. I don't believe that this disease is going to be, you know, the death of me. And I think that, you know, there's this other side to this that is greener and brighter and, you know, it is worth fighting for, I guess is really the way to say it. Yes. Um, so yeah, so to sort of circle back to your question, there are days, Grace, that it's hard. It's very hard. It's mentally exhausting. It's physically exhausting. Uh, and it sucks. It's sad. But there is, you know, there's like no winning in being sad in defeat. And there's a ton of winning and there's a ton to gain from keeping the perspective that there is a light at the end of this tunnel and like I'm going to do everything in my power to get there. Yeah, no, that's really brave of you. Sorry, I was like tearing up a little bit when you were telling them to me. It's just, I can't believe how brave you are. And yeah, it's incredible. Can you just kind of um, tell us, tell everyone, myself and um, all of our viewers here, just kind of like what, tell us more about the United Health Network um, and the Living Donor Program. Yeah, so um, UHN is a collection of two hospitals, Toronto General and Toronto Western Hospital here in Toronto. Um, and within Toronto General, there is a Center for Living Organ Donation, which was founded in 2018. Uh, really with the purpose to help uh, recipients and donors understand uh, living organ donation and to, you know, manage what comes with that. Um, UHN, you know, has kept me really alive for the past <laughs> two years and is a remarkable, remarkable institution. And you know, like I said earlier, I really had no idea that living organ donation was even a possibility. And you and I have talked about this. Like I sort of, you know, think of Grey's Anatomy and, you know, there's like shows about kidneys, but I really had no clue what was possible. And um, the work that they are doing to advance transplants in Canada is pretty remarkable. Um, last year, they were ranked like the top five hospital in the world for transplants, mm -hmm. uh, which is no joke. Um, and, uh, you know, I was speaking to someone about it this morning, and one of the things that they told me was uh, they do one kidney transplant a day, sometimes two if they're lucky, um, which is pretty remarkable. Like, I don't know, like, I brush my teeth once or twice a day. That's pretty much the only thing I do once or twice a day. <laughs> they do that once or twice a day. Uh, I thought it was a pretty impressive number. Yeah. And, um, 
yeah, like living organ donation is just, it's very, I mean, there's risks obviously with any surgery, mm -hmm. um, but it is very low risk to uh, the recipient. And long-term for the donor, it is like one of the best ways to ensure long-term success um, of transplant. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty special what they're doing. Yeah, and um, can you kind of just walk myself and, and our viewers today? Because um, I know when I was doing research on this, I kind of couldn't wrap my mind around, you know, what does it look like for um, someone who does want to be um, a living organ donor? Um, what does it look like before? Like, what's the process? And then what is life after look like for them? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the first stage, obviously, is and just going through some basic blood work tests and urine tests. And one of the things to note is that uh, regardless of blood type, people can give a kidney so long as they're not, you know, they don't have a ton of pre-existing conditions. Um, because they're so, because of some of this invasion I was talking about, like you can, it's, your blood type is not dependent on, on donation. So, um, the sort of first stage is going through some of this preliminary blood blood testing. Then you would go and get like an ECG and do a heart test um, and an MRI, some of those more like technical um, tests. Okay. And then if it's a match and everything is tickety boo, as they would say, the surgery is booked and they take one kidney out of one person and then they pop it in, you know, that's not, the medical term, obviously, like they, uh, forgive me, I'm not a doctor. Uh, they would give it to me. Um, I keep all of my kidneys, so I will end up having three kidneys. Okay. Um, the reason for that is, um, obviously, dialysis is a possibility. It's not something that I want, but it is a possibility. And if the body rejects the organ or the kidney, they need to be able to connect to your kidneys to do dialysis. Um, the recipient is in the hospital for about five days um, and then recovers, recovery can be anywhere from four to six weeks. Okay. Uh, and then they check in with the doctor one, three, uh, six months after just to make sure everything is fine. Uh, and then that's it. Wow. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's obviously a bit heavier up front. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone through all the tests myself. Um, and have found them to be completely fine. One of the, I think the important things to also know about living organ donation is UHN has conducted about like, I don't know, they've done this since like the sixties. Like they have been doing it forever and a day and it's so routine, mm -hmm. um, but they have had zero um, deaths from uh, living organ donations and they've had zero reported cases people coming back with long-term um, issues due to giving a, a, a kidney or, you know, part of their liver. Um, so the success rate is high. That's obviously not with at risk, but uh, on the whole, I mean, I think that's a pretty positive number. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just on that stat of, you know, zero deaths, I, are there any um, miss, uh misconceptions about uh, living donors that you can kind of destigmatize. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the one is obviously blood type, like you can, I have a negative uh, blood type, so I can accept from an A or an O, um, and the positive or the negative doesn't matter. Um, but there's also something called a kidney pairing program, which allows for you to basically swap kidneys with someone who needs it. So, you know, if you have the kidney that I need, but I'm not a match, but you want to donate to me, we can swap and you can, you know, can see how that all works. And that has a chain reaction. Okay. Um, so I think that's part in part what one of the stigmas is, is just thinking that I can only donate if I have the exact same blood type and I can only donate to my family. And like anyone can donate a kidney, like literally a stranger off the street, if they, if they wanted to, could donate a kidney. Um, and, you know, it apparently happens quite frequently where people will just say, 
you know, I'm interested in, in living organ donation and I'd like to give, you know, part of my liver or kidney and, and they will find a donor match. Um, other than that, I, don't, I, I think that's sort of it. Like I, yeah, I, I, and I think that sort of the biggest misconception, I guess, ultimately is that it's possible. You know, I thought all living. I thought all donations came from deceased donors, and so did I. Yeah. Yeah. So there's huge benefit, obviously, to to a living uh, donor, and uh, so yeah. And I guess that that kind of leads into my next question, which is, what are the advantages and then risks for a living organ donor? Yeah. So I think with anything, it's like a big surgery. It is. Um, you're receiving a new foreign object into your body. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be fully, you know, immunocompromised. Immun immunocompromised. Um, so there's certainly risks. Um, the benefit to having a living kidney is that you uh, can be far more like, selective. So you can look at some of those, uh, you know, things that will affect the long-term health of your kidney. You can look at things like age and you know, okay. antibodies and, and such, like those sort of more technical things. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, it's pretty, I would say low risk, ultimately, long term, it is just, you know, you can imagine anything that's living versus deceased, it's better to have something that is alive and well. Mm -hmm. um, and living uh, kidneys just tend to last longer in the body. So it's possible that I will need at some time in my life, probably another kidney transplant. Um, living kidneys uh, last up to like 15 to 20 years. Okay. Um, but disease can obviously be a bit shorter. So when you're thinking about, you know, how often you want to go into surgery and, you know, what uh, is your body primed for surgery? Are you in like good health? Is you know, is your heart in good health? Um, you want to limit the amount of surgeries you have. So a living kidney uh, donation or a living organ donation prolongs that. And mm -hmm. um, it's just a healthier organ generally. Yeah, no, exactly. And and um, how, how can someone um, like reach the living donor program? Um, yes. So um, they can visit the UHN website or the Center for Living organ donation it's uhn.ca um, and there's a form if you go to like my instagram account there's a link to the form um where people can fill out their health history uh, and then you just email it to the uh living kidney um center and a coordinator basically looks through the documents to see if you're eligible and then they will reach out and, you know, their role is really to facilitate a successful transplant, both for me, but also for the recipient. So I think the important thing to note there is if people have questions, if people are unsure about things, if they, you know, want to understand a certain part of testing or a certain part of the surgery, they are, that is the resource that they offer. And it's incredibly important that people feel comfortable with this and you know it's not a small ask of someone to give it an no. organ um so their primary sort of goal is to make sure that people have all the information that they need and can connect them to people you know sort of to my earlier point that have gone through this process to understand and get more information yeah yeah and and just just lastly i just want to touch on um you know like what kind of advice would you give one someone who might be in the same situation as you are um and two what kind of advice would you give someone who is looking to become a living organ donor yeah so in terms of your first question to give advice to somebody who is in a similar situation i think it's really to not be afraid to ask for help first and foremost, to use your network and use the sort of relationships that you have 
to support you through this. Like you cannot do this alone. Mm -hmm. Full stop. It's impossible. And people are willing to help if you are willing to ask for help, but people aren't going to come if you don't, if you don't tell them. So I think not being afraid to ask for help and then just not being afraid generally. And um, it is difficult. It is hard. It's a long road ahead. But like I said earlier, there is a lot to be and a lot to look forward to. Um, and I think that that is an important thing to keep in mind in those sort of like tough, tougher times, I guess. Um, and your second question was? Um, sorry, what, um, what advice would you give to someone who is looking to become a, a living organ donor? Yeah, so I think you really have to, you know, spend the time to, to read up on it, to understand what's involved. Uh, it's not for everyone, and that's okay too, right? Like, there is no expectation that people are just going to be giving, you know, out organs for, for funsies. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing to keep in mind, especially in the context of COVID, is we as, like, a humanity have had this opportunity to really get into the lives of people and to mm -hmm. understand people at a deeper level than we've ever understood them to before and to really be empathetic. Mm -hmm. And we invest so much time in so many things. And this is an opportunity to invest time into humanity and people and community and that's really at the end of the day, I think one of the most powerful things we can do as a, as a specimen of people is give back. And mm -hmm. this is a unique way to do it. It's not typical. It's not, you know, a sexy way of giving. It's pretty grassroots and it's pretty um, intense. But I think that when we invest in one another, we really invest in the long-term success of everyone and everyone benefits from that. Um, so to me, it's about sort of stepping outside of yourself and considering what like the long-term impact could be not only on others, but on like the community at large. Yeah, that's so well put. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Thank you for sharing with uh, with our viewers here today so openly, and um, you know it's very courageous of you. And 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 how can um, can someone get in touch with you to to learn more? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, my Instagram account is I guess here. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could just shoot me a message on Instagram or on Twitter, um, okay. and I would be happy to provide as much information as anybody like awesome well thank you again and, and to our viewers this is ali adams she's marketing and communications at uh, mccarthy's um and yeah thanks again thanks again ali for for talking with me in the audience today this is this is a, a, re a really really powerful conversation yeah thanks so much grace i really appreciate you having me